got to bring the muscle out to move this here. So <laughs> thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Hey, we are going to be in Colossians this morning. And uh, so thankful that we get a morning to celebrate. And in just a short while, we're going to receive the Lord's Supper as well. I just saw someone look at their watch. Yes, we can do it all, I promise. And so uh, we're going to be in Colossians. We've been walking through this book very slowly. This is our fourth week, and we're still in chapter one. We still have one more week in chapter one. We are just crawling through. But Paul has been communicating to the church at Colossae. He's in prison at this point, and he is sending this message along to encourage them and to challenge them. And he's writing saying that Jesus is enough, that he is greater than anything that you face. And whatever that thing is that, is that is just there, tapping on your shoulder, reminding you of that reality, he is greater than that. Anything you lean on that you consider even good in your life, he is greater than that, that Jesus is more than enough. And we talked about in the last number of weeks is how we can know God's will by knowing him. That we have his word, that's how we hear his voice. We also hear it through prayer. And also we know God's people. We're reminded that these are the ways that we know God's will and we know God. And then last week we talked about how Jesus is many things. That Jesus is the image of God. When you look at Jesus, it's who God is. When you look at God, it's who Jesus is. That he's the firstborn over a creation. That he is creator and sustainer of the universe that he is head of the church, that he is firstborn from the dead, that he is the fullness of God, that he is the reconciler of all things. And today we wanna to talk about reconciliation and we're gonna cruise through this. If you're just like, man, that seemed to be good but it was missing something, you can go back and listen to first service. You can find it on YouTube and watch it there. So if you want more to fill in here. And so Paul is writing this and he's saying, God is oh, many different things, but, but God is judge and he's also friend. And we have these things that happen, and so often we can think of God as just judge, where he's out to get me, he's out to condemn me, I am guilty, ah, just this fear that's there. And it's true, we need forgiveness and we need to be justified, made right. Others of us can just be like, well, God is my friend, he loves me, we hang out, we talk, and you know, he's just, we're good. But the reality is, is that he is friend, but we've damaged our relationship because of sin, and we need reconciliation. And so this is what Paul is getting at here today, is that we need to be reconciled to Christ. So starting in chapter 1, verse 21, it says this, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. So what Paul is saying, there's two things. First, you're alienated before Jesus. Before you meet Jesus, before you confess and before you desire to follow after him, you are alienated from God. And also, you are an enemy of God. So if you're in this place where you've not turned your life over to God through Jesus Christ, you are alienated from God, and you are an enemy of God. These are things that just, I don't, I don't want. It's hard for me to even think about before I met Jesus, this reality. But you may be saying, wait, 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 wait. I thought God was a loving God. I thought he cared for me. I thought he desired that none would perish. I thought all these things. It's true. The prophet Isaiah said this, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. God can hear, God can save, but verse 2 says this, But your and my iniquity have separated us from God. Your sin, my sin, has hidden his face from us, that he won't hear. It's not because God lacks, or not because Jesus lacks, but rather it's my sin, it's my iniquity that keeps us separated from God. In Romans, Paul said it this way, the mind governed by the flesh is, what's that word there? Ooh, we're hostile to God, governed by the flesh. And it says it does not submit to God's law, what God says, his word, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. If we're living in the flesh, we cannot please God according to Romans 8, unless Jesus changes us, unless Jesus changes me, unless Jesus changes you. Verse 21 again, it says once. So this is at one point you were alienated from God. So if you have received Jesus, if you walk in his ways, if you walk in the salvation, that was your old story, that you were alienated from God. But the story continues on. Verse 22, it says, but now he has, what's that word? Reconciled. He's reconciled you to Christ by Christ's physical body through death. If you remember last week, we talked about Gnostic teaching that they taught that Jesus wasn't fully human, that it was just this outer shell because God couldn't be in the midst of evil material, that the world was evil itself, the Gnostic teaching. But Paul is saying, no, 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 no. Jesus 
physical. And it was his physical death, this physical sacrifice that restored us, that renewed us, that reconciled us. Romans 5.8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So Jesus was way ahead of every one of us, way ahead of everyone who has lived in the last 2,000 years. That Jesus, he laid his life down, that God demonstrated his love for you, for me, for everyone that's lived while we were still sinners. That he died for each one of us. Why is this the case? Well, verse 22 continues, to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, free from accusation. Now those are big words. Holy, without blemish, and free from accusation. These are realities that none of us can live up to. We may try to, but we are not holy. We are not without blemish. We are not free from accusation. We are sinners who need a savior, we need to be saved by grace. And what Paul does here in this short passage is he intentionally uses Old Testament imagery. In the Old Testament, the Israelites would go to the temple and they would sacrifice an animal to cover their sin. So whatever that sin is, they go to the temple and they're like, all right, here's my animal. And the sin is covered. They go home, they sin again, and they're like, ah, all right, animal, back to the temple, here we go. My right, sin is covered, go home, ah, here we go, back and forth, right? I mean, the priest would be like, oh, here comes Chris again. He's back. But this is this perpetual cycle. And the priests at the temple were not only there to assist with the sacrifices, they were there to inspect the animal. Deuteronomy 15, 21 says this, if an animal has a defect, is lame or blind or any serious flaw, you must not sacrifice it to the Lord your God. So this sacrifice had to be pure, holy, without blemish. Some of these words that Paul used in Colossians. In verse 22 of Colossians, this physical body of Jesus, he points to, are these things that it's not about what I do or me trying to be righteous, but rather it's what Jesus has done. The author of Hebrews said it this way. He said, the blood of goats and bulls and ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, Cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. The author of Hebrews is saying it's Jesus. Jesus offered himself unblemished, pure. Romans 5 tells us that since we've now been justified by his blood, how much more will we be saved from God's wrath through him? We've been justified by the work of Jesus on the cross. And we've also been given the, the gift of the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says this, God who made him who had, sorry, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We may still sin, but we're positionally righteous, God's eyes. It looks kind of like this. Michael, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to help me over here. Michael, I'm gonna need your help here. Michael, you're gonna be Jesus. Can you, can you do that? You mind seeing him? Okay, don't, don't go around telling people later today that you're Jesus, that you went to church and someone said you're Jesus. That's gonna cause a whole lot of issues for you and for me. All right, and so Michael is gonna play Jesus. And so Jesus is that sacrifice. He's, he's that righteousness. Now, I'm Chris, all right? And we're just gonna pretend that you all are God. Again, don't go around saying you're God. It's just weird and creepy, all right? And so when you look at me right now, you see me. You see me for who I am, and, and if you could really see the, the blemishes and the impurities and the thoughts and all that, you see me. I am imperfect. But Jesus comes. I'm going to have you step in front of me here. You mind? I'm going to put my hands on your shoulders here. Now, this group over here who's looking at me, this is what Paul's getting at, is now you don't just see me. You may see me, but you're looking through Jesus here. So we're going to turn a little bit here. Same things. So you're going to see me. Yep, I'm here, but you're looking through the lens of Jesus. You're going to look through Jesus. Let's just keep spinning, all right? All right, here we go. I don't think we need to spin all the way around, but that'd just be fun, all right? We'll just keep spinning around. Here we go, here we go. We just went all the way around. You, you, you didn't know you'd be part of this here today. So, so let's give Michael a round of applause there. So God sees us through the lens of Jesus. Jesus' purity, his unblemished reality. This is what salvation is. 
It's not what I've done. It's what Jesus has done. Jesus, in fact, he tells a parable in Matthew 22 where he tells his servants, he says, just go out and bring everyone into the wedding feast. Invite everyone that you can find. And so people come to the feast. And they're there, and, and the host gives them a wedding garment, it says. So whatever they came in wearing, they've been transformed. They've been put on the gift that the host has given them. And the scripture continues on in verse 11 of Matthew 22. It says, but when the king came to see the guest, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. And he asked, how did you get in without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then verse 13, then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now again, this could be a troubling passage because you're like, okay, this king is the God that I like that invites everyone in and is welcoming and here you go freely, on and on and on. But then we get to this last verse and you may be saying like, that seems really insensitive. I mean, this one person didn't have this wedding garment on when they were invited in and he throws them out. And the story that Jesus is telling there is there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And what this is, is when you weep, there's like this sadness, this heartbreak. A gnashing of teeth is like this regret reality of, oh, like I missed the invitation. Here's the deal. The king invited the wedding guests and some people said no. And they stayed outside. Jesus gives an invitation, even here today, through what we're talking about, an invitation to you that you have already said yes to, or you may say yes to today or in the future, or you may say no to. But that's your choice. God is welcoming you, giving you the gift of salvation, and it is your choice what you do with it. But at the end, it's regret and weeping when we're like, oh, we missed it. Desires that none will perish, none will be separated, but it is our choice. God has made a way through Jesus. He is judge, and he's just, and we need forgiveness, and we need this justification, being right in his image. He is also friend, but we've broken that relationship, and so we need that reconciliation. See, the work that Jesus has done, it's been done. It's for your, you to receive or to reject. And our part continues in verse 23 where it says, if you continue in your faith, which Paul describes as established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is a gospel which you've heard and have been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. If you continue, meaning persevere, meaning continue in your faith to the very last breath, Meaning, continue to build upon the rock. Stand firm. Hold on to the truth. Hold on, hold on, hold on. As I was thinking about this, there's not many of us who are in this space here today or watching online that will flat out in the future deny Jesus or deny faith. There's not many of us that will do that. There may be some. But what really terrifies me is is the other reality that can happen, which I think more of us will either continue to live into or just move toward. And, and what that is, is, is that we exist or move towards a mediocre faith. It's what Jesus said to the church at Laodicea in Revelation and called it lukewarm. He said, you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other. Jesus is saying, Either be totally with me or totally apart. Be reconciled or be alienated. Choose one or the other. Don't just sit in the middle. It says this, because you're lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich and have acquired wealth and I don't need a thing. Like, I'm comfortable. I'm good. And Jesus says, but you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. You don't realize where you're at. All right, Jesus, I need you again. All right, we got Jesus here. So what Jesus is saying, what Revelation is saying, is be with Jesus. Be reconciled to Jesus in relationship, close proximity. 
All right. Now, now, Matt back there. Matt, can you wave? There you go. That's Matt. That's alienation. That's the cold. This is the hot. This is the cold. Sorry, Matt. Matt's a good guy. Don't, don't take it personally. We need to, like, hug it out later. Let's do that. All right. So there's the cold. There's the hot. There's with Jesus. And there's over here. And what Jesus is saying is so often what we do is we're like, hey, I'm good. I'm here. I see Jesus. Hey, Jesus. I can hear what's going on. I, I feel close. And I'm not really hot, I'm kind of in this lukewarm state, but I feel good. And then I look over here and I'm like, there's cold over there. There's Matt. At least I'm not like where Miriam and Joanna are. I mean, they're so close to the cold, right? I'm not like them. I'm closer to Jesus, right? And I feel good. And we exist in this lukewarm reality, this middle reality. Because at least if I'm over there where Miriam and Joanna are, maybe I'll see my need. I'll see how far I am away. I'll see how desperate I am. I'll see where I'm at, what I'm living in. But if I'm here, I'm better than them in my mind, and I'm still semi close to Jesus. Does this make sense? Jesus is saying, once again, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Joanna. And Mary. So where are you? Where are you? Paul is saying once you are in this place, once you are alienated, once you were separated. He's saying, but now he's reconciled you. This is the gift of Jesus, to be reconciled to him. This is the present reality. And what he wants to do is, as in verse 22, it says, to present you holy in his sight without blemish, free of accusation. And not because of what I did, but because of the lens of Jesus, seeing through. And he's saying, hold on, hold on, hold on. This is what I'm going to ask you to do. Is on the screen behind me, there's just two questions. I want you to process this, these realities here. I think they're there. There you go. This first, where's your story? Are you with Jesus or are you alienated? Am I alienated from God or have I been reconciled through Jesus as my Savior, confessing my sin and my need for him? Have I placed my trust in the finished work of Jesus that he did on the cross through his death, burial, and resurrection? And will I today begin my walk with him as both Savior and Lord? This is you. You're in this place of alienation. Reconciliation is this invitation. It's like this king that threw the party. Here's your invitation. Jesus is extending this to you. Or that second question, if you're walking with him, is consider what it means to continue in the faith, established and firm. The middle ground is not established and firm. With Jesus is established and firm. What does this look like? What does this mean? Would you take a moment and just prayerfully consider, process, Ask God's spirit to just to reveal something to you, to tap you on the shoulder, to, to move something in your heart. And then I'll close this in just a moment in prayer. Heavenly Father, gracious God, we thank you for the gift of Jesus, the gift of salvation. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins, Lord, that you have reconciled us to yourself. And we have the opportunity really to say yes or to say no. And Jesus, today, I just pray in maybe those moments of reflection or even now, that those who are alienated, who are apart from you, would receive your invitation. Lord, would confess that they are a sinner, that they are in need of a savior, but that they need you. And God, for those of us who have initially prayed that, who have just been walking, God, I pray that we would draw near to you. Lord, thank you for the saving work that you continue to do in each and every one of us throughout all stages of our life. God, all stages of our, our walk with you. And Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for what Jesus, you did on the cross, your broken body, your shed blood.
Lord, in just a moment as we receive the elements here, we give you thanks. It may be a time of remembrance and confession and a recommitment to you. We pray this in your name. Amen.